In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Well, today is the Feast of the Baptism of Christ. And it seems just a little bit out of sequence. By that I mean, just last week, we were observing the visit of the Magi to the little baby Jesus. And a week or two before that, we were celebrating the birth of that baby. And now, all of a sudden, Jesus is a grown man. It's a heck of a growth spurt. So what happened? Why do we have this incredible jump from baby to full-grown man? Well, for one reason, we are Episcopalians. And we have traditionally associated baptism with infancy. So even though in Scripture he's an adult, we put baptism right up next to the birth. Now that doesn't quite make sense, but let it be so now. Besides, that's kind of emblematic of Christ's entire ministry. There is so much of his ministry that doesn't quite seem right. The very baptism itself doesn't quite seem right, does it? And that's what John the Baptist was saying. He's saying, I should be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. And then, right after the baptism, right after the Spirit of God descends upon Jesus and the voice of God says, This is my Son, my Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. What does God do? Drives them out into the wilderness to fast and to be tempted. How does that make sense? And yet, Throughout all of Jesus' ministry, there's a whole lot more than that. It just all seems a little bit off. I mean, you can actually go before that to his birth. Depending on which gospel you're reading, he's either born on the run, born in a barn, living as a refugee. And not only that, but think about the people who come to praise him as the king of the Jews. The poorest of the poor and foreigners. That's a little bit off. And then as he grows, and you may not have picked up on this reading the scriptures, but as he grows, he is in constant conflict with his own family. A couple of small examples. The wedding at Cana. What we think about mostly is, oh, Jesus turned water into wine. But pay attention to the conversation with Mary beforehand. She is absolutely fed up with him because he calls her something that in those days and that time is really quite rude. What he says to her is, woman, mind your own business. Now, this is her son. And then she just throws up her hands and says, I'll do whatever he says and walks away. That's not the least of it, though. Later on in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, his brothers make fun of him. And John says that's because they didn't even believe in him. Not even they believed in him. And then look in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3. And you could look in Matthew and Luke as well, because they all have it. Where Jesus is preaching... And he's working so hard that he doesn't have time to eat. And what it says in the Gospel is that his family came to collect him because they thought he was out of his mind. That's not me interpreting it. That's the words. It doesn't seem quite right that Jesus is working in these kind of conditions where everybody around him is harassing him and making fun of him. But even in what he teaches, there's something just a little bit off. Remember that parable he tells about a bad guy sowing weeds 
into a, a, a farmer's wheat field. Remember that parable? And later on, all the servants come to the farmer and say, the, this, this bad guy has sown weeds in your wheat field. Do you want us to go and tear it all out? And what does the farmer say? Let it be as it is for now. We'll take care of the weeds later. Let it be so now. That's just a little bit off. Will you let the bad grow with the good? And you can keep going on with this. Right up to the crucifixion itself. Which does not seem right for the Son of God. So why? Why does Jesus seem okay with things being not quite right? How can he live with this let it be so now attitude? Well, notice what he says after he says let it be so now. He says in order to fulfill all righteousness. Things may not seem quite right, but in the bigger picture, they may well fall into place, may well be necessary. Being baptized in the days of John wasn't about giving your life over to following Christ. That happened well later. In those days, baptism was an act of repentance, an act you could do over and over and over again, by the way. But Jesus is the Son of God who doesn't need to repent of anything. And that's what bothers John. Yet Jesus says, doing this fulfills all righteousness because it puts him squarely in the traditions of the people of God. And that is hugely important to Matthew and his audience. To fulfill what the prophets have said. To fulfill the traditions to be fully and squarely in the tradition, to be fully and squarely one of the people. Jesus submits to this humbling act as a sign that he is one of us. It doesn't seem quite right, but on the other hand, would the people of Israel have listened to him if he had separated himself from them? Would his teaching, his healing, his sacrifice, his resurrection, would they have had the impact that they did if people hadn't bothered to even listen to him? In all his ministry, Jesus worries far less about people showing him the proper respect or things looking just right or the situations being proper. He even worries far less about all those things than about fulfilling righteousness. And for him, this is always, always about embodying God's love. You do this too. I do this too. We all do this too in some way, shape, or form. In order to embody God's love, we let things go. We let things be not quite right. Want a small example? Have you ever had a kid give you a picture they drew. In that picture, the people are misshapen. And they have hands that are way too big, bigger than their heads. And they have different numbers of fingers on each hand. And then there's a house, and it happens to be smaller than the dog. And you can't quite tell if those are trees or maybe sheep. And what do you do? You praise the beauty and the artistry of that picture. Because there is beauty in it. And because it is far more important to let the artistry go aside for now. To let the mistakes go. So that you can embody God's love. That has a whole lot bigger payoff than telling a kid, well, thank you for it, but you did this wrong, and you did that wrong, and you did that wrong. 
Or have you ever been to a family function where things were just a little bit off? Where there's that one relative or that one friend who tells just a really bad joke? Or someone who has expressed a view that you don't hold with? And you have to determine right at that moment, do I say something or do I let it slide for now? Because to say something now in this moment would be to cause more harm. There are times we are called to swallow being right in order to be loving. And that's just the way the world is. We live in a world that is not quite right in more ways than we can count. But this is the world we're given to live in. And this is the world we are called by God to operate in. And more often than than not, things will not be right. We have, just in our country alone, a growing income gap with growing poverty. We have mass incarceration. We have climate change. We have increases in hate crimes. We have institutional racism. I could go on, but you get the point. Things aren't quite right. Let it be so for now. Jesus says we are to live within the system in which God has placed us. And that's this country, in this continent, in this world. We are to look around and see the bigger picture. The desire of God that we love God and that we act with God's love toward our neighbors. The The bigger picture is that we embody the love of God in this building and outside of this building, today and always. We may not always have to prove ourselves right. We don't have to win every argument. Certainly not if that would cause harm to someone else. That doesn't mean that Jesus ignores what's wrong in the world. Absolutely not. In the reading from Acts, Peter reminds us how Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Jesus did not ignore the pain of the world or the oppression. And we don't either. Yesterday, I was uh, co-leading a retreat with Father Masood ibn Said Allah, who uh, we've been leading a series of retreats in the year of apology about what it means to apologize for the sin of slavery and its descendants. Father Masood began the retreat with this prayer from the Book of Common Prayer. Grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression. That's not the prayer of people who ignore what's going on. That's the the prayer of people who knowingly live in an imperfect world, knowingly engage themselves in a world that they know they're not going to fix, but also a world in which we know we can embody the love of God. The world is a mess, but let it be so now. Let it be so now is a way of saying that you don't wait for things to be right. You don't wait for people to give you the proper respect because those things are irrelevant. What is relevant isn't that the world be better. We want to work toward it. But I promise you this. When each one of us dies, it will still be 
a violent, messed up, imperfect world. Act anyway. And if to embody God's love, it's necessary to do something that you deem unnecessary or humbling or irritating, let it be so. The point of Christ's baptism wasn't to please certain people, it wasn't to earn respect. It was to better embody God's love. The point of being in tension with his family was not to upset them, but to do the work that better embodied God's love. The point of the parable of the weeds and the wheat isn't to ignore the weeds, but to show that we can embody God's love in the midst of a messed up world, which was the very point of the baptism of Christ in the first place. This all requires a certain humility and practicality. Is righteousness fulfilled by our action? If so, do it. It doesn't matter if people are impressed by us or don't even notice us. And if that doesn't seem quite right, well, let it be so for now. Amen.